In this first half of the course, we focus primarily on the client side. We've talked about HTML and CSS, um, and we've also done a little bit of JavaScript. We've talked about how to program the client, to program the web browser. Now it's time to shift gears. Now we're going to talk not about the client side so much, but about the server side. What happens on the web server? And we're going to see that uh, the server is really useful for allowing communication between different users and for storing persistent data. Let's get started. So we're going to introduce server-side scripting in these next couple lectures. Uh, why do we want to do that? Well, if we're working in the client, if we're working in the web browser with JavaScript, we can store information, but we can only store it temporarily. If we create a variable in a JavaScript, then a JavaScript file, that variable will go away when the web browser is closed. It's not persistent. We say it's temporary or transitory. It only lasts for the lifetime of the session. As soon as the browser window is closed, that variable goes away. So if we want persistent storage, if we want to save information so it can be used later, uh, if we want to save information so that the user can access it from other systems or maybe from other web browsers on the same system, then we need to do that on the server side. Another reason to use server-side scripting is that we want users to be able to communicate with each other. So if I log in to my blog and I put up a post, I don't want that information saved in my web browser because then other people won't be able to see it. I want it stored on the server where other people who log in can download it and see it too. So we're going to talk about how to uh, store things on the server and how to manipulate things on the server. And another name for that is that we're going to talk about dynamic content. So up until now, most of our content has been static content. That means that it doesn't change. Every time I visit the web page, I see the same information. I see the same page. OK, with JavaScript, we can do a little bit of uh, dynamic content. But by and large, when we first log in, everything is the same. Now we're going to be talking about dynamic content. We're going to talk about content that can be created on the fly. Every time I log in, I might get something different. In other words, the web page now is going to respond to input from me, to information that I give it. So I'm going to give it information, it's going to process that information, and it's going to generate a web page that didn't exist before that I will see in my browser. So there are a lot of uses of server-side scripting. One of them is the ability to log into a website. Uh, we're going to talk ab about how to process login credentials. So uh, without server-side scripting, there's no point in having logins because um, I can only log in from my one web browser. It doesn't help me uh, store persistent data that I can access from other logins on other systems or other browsers. Uh, we're going to talk about storing records like online banking transactions, uh, storing blog posts, information about a blog post like the title and the author. Now, if we want to do this, really there's two different things we have to do. There's two parts to storing dynamic content. One is getting information from the user. So if we want to respond to the information the user is giving us, they need some way to tell us the information. The second part is taking that information that the user provides and transforming it in some way or storing it in some way and sending back some kind of answer, some kind of analysis. Maybe it's a report, maybe it's a login successful message, but we're going to analyze that data and do something with it. So we're going to take care of the first part, getting information from the user with HTML forms. And so today we're going to talk about HTML and the kinds of elements that it provides for taking input from a user. The second part, processing the information, we're going to um, do using server-side scripts. So starting in the next lecture, we're going to talk about Python and we're going to learn how to process the information from a form. We might do a little bit with that in this lecture too. So. Um, in order to do this, we need to introduce some new elements that we haven't talked about uh, that HTML provides. And the most important one is the form element. And a form is just a way th to ask the user for information. So as with all of our elements, there's a form tag and a slash form tag. And everything in between the form tag and the slash form tag is part of an HTML form. Typically, when we have a form, inside we'll have several different form input fields. And uh, there might be just one, but usually there will be several. And uh, we can also have some buttons that do different actions on the information in that form. Uh, the most important is the submit button. So here I've uh, given you an example of a form. And instead of having form input fields, we would actually put real tags there. 
And then at the bottom we have an input of type submit. This is how you create a submit button. And when the user clicks the submit button, the form is going to be submitted to the server and the server is going to send back some response that will show up in the browser. Now the form element has uh, many attributes, but the three most important are the action attribute, which gives the URL of the script to run. So this is where the data is going to go. Uh, we're going to take the data out of the form and we're going to send it to this script. Uh, it takes a method, which is usually going to be post. If you remember, uh, several lectures ago, we talked about different HTTP methods. I think in lecture one, we said that there's a get method and a post method and um, a head method, several a put in the a delete method. So there's all of these methods that we can use from HTTP. Typically, we're going to use post. In fact, in all of the projects for this class, you're going to use post for your method. You may see some websites that use get. The difference is that with a get request, the information is actually encoded in the URL. With post, the information is encoded in the body of the HTTP request. And the reason that that's important is that URLs have a maximum length. So with get, we can't send more than 255 bytes of information. So we're going to use post instead. Post will allow us to send more information, and it will also allow us to upload files, which you can't do with get. Finally, there's an enc type attribute that stands for encoding type. That tells the web browser how to split up the different pieces of information, how to separate them in the HTTP request so that the server can interpret them. We are always going to use multi-part slash form data for this. Multi-part slash form data is the pretty standard way to do this. There are others, and you can read about them in the RFC. Uh, if you Google um, HTTP RFC, you can read about uh, multi-part form data and its cousins. But um, they are well beyond the scope of this class, and nobody uses them anyway. So. Uh, we've created our form and our slash form tags. What do we put in between those two tags? What kinds of form inputs can we use? Well, there are lots of different elements in HTML5. And the, some of the most important are text inputs. So if you create an input element with type set to text, the web browser will display a little box that you can type text into. And uh, you can specify a width. There's a width attribute that lets you say, OK, I expect about 50 characters of input or about 10 characters of input. But if you just leave it blank, um, if you don't specify a width, it'll use a default size, I think, of maybe 16 or 20 characters wide. Um, and that's pretty straightforward. The user can type any string they want, and it'll uh, appear all in one line. If they type more text uh, than will fit in that text box, the text will actually scroll to the left. And they can use the cursor key to go back and forth and see what's at the beginning of the input and at the end. Uh, but HTML also provides some other text input fields. So in addition to the text input, uh, there's a password input element that we can add to a form. And that uh, password input is really just a text input. But it has this interesting property that uh, when the user types text into the password field, instead of the actual letters and numbers and characters showing up, uh, the web browser will hide the information with little stars. So every time you type a key, it'll put a little star into the field. Uh, and that lets you see the length of the string that you've typed without uh, allowing somebody who's watching over your shoulder to see what you've typed. I want to point out that this is not a security feature. Well, it is in a sense. It protects you from having somebody shoulder surf. But it doesn't actually encrypt the information in any way. The information is still stored in plain text in the browser. And it can be accessed through JavaScript. So if uh, some kind of malicious script is running, um, that script can see the text of the password that you typed. It can just access that field. And when it gets the text, it won't appear as a bunch of stars. It'll appear as what you typed. This makes sense, because you need to know what was typed in order to use it. Uh, it doesn't help us if we send it to the server a bunch of stars. right? That doesn't. The server will be like, what are all these stars for? Um, so you want to actually send the password, and that's what we do. Uh, it's not encrypted when it's sent to the server either. If you're using HTTP to send form information to a server, it's sent in plain text. And anybody that can snoop that network connection, anybody that can sniff packets, can see your password. So you need to use HTTPS, the secure HTTP, or some other form of encryption, maybe some sort of JavaScript AJAX thing that uh, 
scrapes the form and then encrypts it before sending it to the server. You need to do some more work if you want to protect that information. Just using a password field instead of a text field it doesn't really protect the information. All it does is make it so that somebody looking over your shoulder can't see what you typed. Well, okay, if they're watching your keyboard, maybe they can, but it makes it harder. Finally, there's another way to input text, and that's to use a text area. If you use a text input, you only get one line to enter data on. But sometimes we want to put in something that's several lines of text, maybe a couple paragraphs. And if we want to do that, uh, we can use a text area widget. And the text area element um, starts with text area and ends with slash text area. Anything you put in between will become the default text for that field. So it'll type it in as if they typed it. And if they want to get rid of it, they can highlight and delete it. Um, like a text input, uh, you can type any kind of text you want. And when you submit the form, that text field will be sent to the server. But the difference is that instead of just having one row of text, a text area has rows and columns. And you can specify how many rows and columns to make the text area using the rows and calls attributes. HTML5 added a whole bunch of new text inputs. So in addition to having just a standard text input that lets you put in any kind of text, uh, HTML5 adds several text entries for specific purposes. So for example, there is an email input type. So you can make an email input field, and uh, you can do some validation to make sure that when the user types something into that field, that their input is a valid email address. So when they click Submit, it won't let them submit if they didn't type in something with an at sign, for example. Similarly, there are text input fields for entering URLs, uh, web addresses, for entering telephone numbers, that's the tell type, and uh, keywords for a search, so search terms. I want to point out that unfortunately, not all web browsers support all of these new fields. Most of them don't. In fact, Chrome has very good support for the date picker widget we're going to talk about in a minute, but Firefox doesn't. Um, Internet Explorer doesn't support very many of these at all. So support is kind of mixed for these, but the nice thing about this is that uh, HTML5 was designed with a fallback in place. If you try to use one of these fancy text fields and the browser doesn't support it, it will just provide a text box, a normal text box instead. So they can still type it in, it just may not look as nice in the browser because it won't have all the fancy features. Uh, if you want to enter numeric data, if, if you want the user to be able to put in maybe an age or uh, some kind of quantity, you can use the number input type. So you can say angle bracket input, type gets number, angle bracket, um, and uh, it'll give it a widget, it'll produce a widget that lets them type in numbers. It looks like a text widget, except that on some browsers, it'll have an up arrow and a down arrow that allows them to increment and de uh, decrement the number. So they can increase and decrease the number by clicking on those arrows instead of having to do it by hand in the text field. Another of the, the nicer inputs is something called a range. This allows the user to specify a range of values. And uh, on some browsers, this is actually represented not with a text field, but with a slider that they can drag back and forth. To make that work, you have to use the min and max attributes. You can set a minimum value and a maximum value, and it will create a slider of appropriate length and allow them to choose the number by sliding the slider back and forth. I mentioned before that there's a date picker widget. Chrome supports this. Firefox has very rough support for this. Um, Internet Explorer, I don't think, supports this yet. Um, some browsers do, some browsers don't. But if you say input type gets date, uh, it'll bring up this nice little calendar widget. And you can actually select a month and a year and then click on a day. And it will put a date in as a string into the text field. There's a similar widget for selecting times. For selecting dates and times, you can do date time. A date time is a type of field. Uh, for picking a month of the year or a week of the year. If you just slam a bunch of input fields into your form, it doesn't look very nice. So typically what you do is you put a label with your form. Uh, you want to put a label there so that the user knows what this big uh, input field is for, this big square that they can type things into. Uh, they need to know what they're supposed to put there. So typically you'll put a label there, and usually the label is just text. Well, HTML provides a label tag that identifies the label. And the reason that you want to do this is that if you uh, put a label tag in, the user can click on that label 
and it will automatically change the focus of the window so that they can type into the form element. What do I mean by that? Suppose that I have a text field that allows the user to type in their username. I probably want to put some text in front of it that says user colon. So I've got user colon and then I've got this text field. If the user clicks on the word user or the colon, the cursor is going to move into the text field so they can start typing their username. So it's nice to associate these two things. It's not essential, but it makes the page uh, more interactive and behave, it, it helps it behave better, uh, more in line with what people expect. So uh, to do that, you create a label tag. The label takes one attribute, a for attribute, F-O-R, and you set it equal to the ID of the uh, input element. So you have to set the ID attribute in your actual input element, but then you can use the for attribute in the label to match them together. If you want to make things look a little bit more attractive, you can group form elements together into field sets. Uh, basically, this draws a box around them with a nice little tab at the top, some kind of label that says, OK, these are the user. This is the user section of the form. This is the group section of the form. This is the organization section of the form. So you could maybe um, split up your form into different pieces. Or maybe you could do, this is the contact information section of the form. This is the um, conference registration section of the form. And this is the journal section of the form. Uh, anything that you want to do, you can split up your form into different parts. And it will look really nice. It'll draw this box around them that you can style with CSS. Um, and it gives the field set itself a label. You can set the label using the legend element. So um, we group elements by putting field set and slash field set around them. And then we label each field set by adding a legend tag and a slash legend tag with some text in between to the field set. I'll show you an example of that at the end of the lecture. So here's a more comprehensive example. Notice I start my form with a form tag, and I end it with a slash form tag. Now, if I were really doing this, I would have some attributes to my form tag. I'd have an action and a method and an encoding type. But um, I didn't want to make the slide really busy, so I've just got a form tag and a slash form tag. After the form tag, I have a label and an input element. So the label says it's for the first element. And the label is the text first name. I can have any HTML I want there. If I want to make first name bold, I could put B tags around it, and B tag and slash B tag around it. Then I have my slash label tag to indicate that I'm done with the label. And then I have my input. And I give it the ID first so that it'll match the for attribute of my label. I set its type to text. I can actually omit that because by default, input tags are text inputs. I give it the name first. I have to do that so that my script will know which field goes with which piece of information. Then I have another label for last name, and I've created another text input for the last name. I've put a BR tag in, a line break, to wrap to the next line. So I'm going to have the words first name, and then an input field for the first name, then the words last name, and an input field for the last name, and then I'm going to go to the next line and start over. And on the next line, I'm going to have a label that says age, followed by a number input for the age. And I'm setting the default value to 18. So by default, the age will be 18. They can click the up arrow to change it to 19 or 20. They can click the down arrow to change it to 17 or 15 or 2. Um, and they can manipulate it that way. Or they can highlight it and just type in an age. And then I have a break tag to go to the next slide. And so beneath that, I have the email address. Excuse me. That's an input of type email. And that'll let them type in a validly formatted email address. Um, I have a line break. And then on the next line, I have a website label, followed by a URL type input. And then on the next line, I have a birthday label with a date picker widget, an input of type date. And finally, at the bottom of my form, I have a submit button. So this is what it looks like. I have my first name label, followed by my input box for the first name. My last name label, followed by my last name input. My age label followed by my um, field for the, for the age. Notice Firefox doesn't support the number type, and so there's no arrows in Firefox. Sorry, in Chrome. Chrome doesn't support age. Uh, if I'd done this in a different web browser, I might have gotten the nice little arrows. Um, I have a field for my email address, a field for my website. Notice that HTTP colon slash slash is in there because it's a URL type. Um, and then I have my date picker widget for the birthday. So I can uh, click on this calendar widget and see the birthday. Chrome supports this. Firefox doesn't, or at least it doesn't have very good support for it yet. 
Um, and then at the bottom of my form, I have my submit button. So text fields are, in some ways, the easiest input to use. Certainly, they're the easiest to handle in my script. But there are other kinds of inputs that HTML supports. And uh, one of those is that it supports checkboxes and radio buttons. So to create a checkbox, I create an input of type checkbox. And if I have several of these, um, I can check or uncheck uh, any of them. And when I submit, a list of the ones that are checked will get sent to the script. Similarly, I can have radio buttons. I just create an input of type radio, and I can have multiple ones of those. The difference is that if I use a checkbox, I can have several of them selected. If I have a radio button, uh, it lets me pick from a list of alternatives, so only one of them can be selected at a time. If I select one, it'll unselect the others in the same group. Checkboxes and radio buttons are usually used in groups. So again, with checkboxes, I can select multiple things from the group. With radio buttons, I can only select one of the things in the group. And the way that I identify the groups is I use the name attribute. So I give each of the checkboxes the same name attribute. Then I'll put them in the same group. So I put the name of the group in the name attribute of a checkbox uh, input field. Similarly, I use the name uh, to group radio buttons together. So I'll give uh, four or five different radio buttons the same name. That'll put them in the same group. And it'll only allow me to pick from one of those options within the group. If I have radio buttons with two different names, I'll have two different groups of radio buttons. And I could pick one thing from the first group and one thing from the second group. So how do I distinguish between the different options? I use the value attribute. So here's an example. Here I've created my form, and I have my slash form tag at the bottom. And uh, at the top, I have four checkboxes. So I have um, uh, four checkboxes. All of them are named menu because they're all in the menu group. But they all have different values. The first one has the value lasagna. The second one has the value ravioli. The third one has the value spaghetti. And the last one has the value ziti. Notice that I've put text between the input tag and the slash input tag. That's the text that will actually show up next to the checkbox. The value field is the value that will be sent to the server. They don't necessarily have to be the same. It's usually a pretty good idea to make them the same, but maybe um, I want to use spaces or some kind of formatting uh, next to the checkbox. My server doesn't want to have to deal with that, so I could use a much simpler string for my value and then have a more complicated, fancy-looking formatted string for uh, the text that shows up on the web page. Similarly, I have a break tag to go to the next line. And then I have three radio buttons, three radio inputs. Again, they all have the same name because I want them to be in the same button group, the payment group. And they have different values. So there's a check, credit, and the magic value. So pay by check, pay by credit card, or pay by magical deposit. Let me tell you, that's how I want to pay. And at the bottom, I again have my submit button. So in the web page, that looks like this. Notice that I can select multiple checkboxes. Here I've got both lasagna and ziti checked. But I can only select one radio button. So right now I have pay by credit card checked. Um, I could check pay by magical deposit, but if I clicked on that, it would unselect the credit card. And then I have my submit button. Another kind of input is a combo box. This goes by different names. Sometimes it's called a drop down list. Basically, I'm going to provide a list of possible values, um, and the user can click on it. And a menu will come up that allows them to choose which one they want. Uh, it's sort of like multiple choice. <coughs> Excuse me. So a combo box in HTML is done using a select tag. And I give the select tag a name attribute that specifies the group, the name of the field. And then within the select and slash select tags, I put several option tags. So each option I want to show up in my menu has its own option element. And I set the value of each element to some string that will identify it to the script. So here I've set value to value 1. And I've also set um, the second option's value to value 2. Um, notice that if you want to pick a default option, it doesn't necessarily have to be the first option. Uh, you can add the Boolean attribute selected to the tag. And that will set a selected to true. And that will uh, make that particular option the default option. So in this case, value will be my default option. Value 1 will be my default option. So here's an example. I've got my form and slash form tags. And uh, at the bottom, I've got my submit button. And before my submit button, I have select. And I've set the ID field of my select box to course. Um, I've also set the name to course. So in my, 
in my script, I'm going to access the course field and it will give me the value. I have four options. Um, their values are 162, 201, 375, and 471. The value attribute tells me what the script will receive if I select that option. Between the option and the slash option tags, I also have some text. CMSC 162, CMSC 201, ISCS 375, and ISCS 471. That's the text that will actually show up in the menu. So if I click on the combo box, I'm going to get a menu that will say CMSC 162, CMSC 201, ISCS 375, and ISCS 471. If I were to click on one of those, like ISCS 375, uh, the web browser is actually going to send 375 to the server. It's not going to send ISCS 375. It's just going to send the value 375 to the server. It's going to basically say name equals 375. Um, sorry, not name, course equals 375 because the name of the select field was course and the value of the option was 375. So here's what a combo box looks like. So I've got my drop down menu and here I've clicked on CMSC 201 and I have my submit button. So HTML5 provides many other inputs um, and four of the important ones are these. I can have a color type input that will actually pull up a color wheel in some browsers and allow me to pick a color. And it will uh, represent it as like an RGB color code. I can upload files by uh, using a file type input. That will give me a little file name box with a browse button. And when the user clicks browse, it will usually pull up their operating system's file dialog. They can um, click their way to a file and when they double click on it or click open, it will uh, load the link to that file into the file name field. And when they submit, it'll actually upload the file. There's a type of input called a reset input that clears the form. So if you um, want to cancel everything that you've done, you can add a reset button and they can click it and the form will go away. I mean, the form will be there, but all the information will go away. And finally, of course, we have to be able to submit our information. So there's a submit button. Almost all of these inputs also take attributes. In particular, an input tag takes a type attribute. That tells us what type of input field to create. And we've already talked about all the different types. Well, not all of them, but many of the different types that you can use. Typically, an input will also have a name. This is the name of the data item. And we're going to send that name to the server, to the script that's running on the server. They'll also have a value, which is the value of the data item. Uh, it's the default value. So when the user um, types in information and hits enter, what will happen is that we're going to send a list of key value pairs to the server. And those key value pairs will consist of the name field, an equal sign, and then the value that the user typed in. Another attribute that you can specify is the disabled attribute. You don't have to say disabled equals something. You can just say disabled. And that will show the form element, but it will gray it out so that the user can't type anything into it. Why would you want to do that? Well, we can actually use JavaScript to re-enable the element. And so this is really useful if you want to make sure that some information in your form is filled out before other information is filled out. You can disable the element and then in response to a JavaScript event, re-enable it. Another Boolean attribute is the required attribute. This just tells the web browser that it shouldn't try to send the form to the server until all of the required information is present. And so required marks an input field as required. It won't allow you to submit the form without it. So here are some examples. I've created an input with name, name, and value, default value, Bob, and it's required. Because I didn't specify a type, this will be a text input. I have an input with name, phone, and value 395-2190. I think that's my department chair's phone number. I'm not sure. Um, again, it's a text field because there's no type. And I can have an input of type submit and value submit. Uh, in this case, the value for, an in, for a submit button uh, changes what text shows up on the button. So if I change the value to something like login, instead of saying submit on the button, it would say login. It's a little weird. I don't know why they did it that way. Another attribute that you can specify in an input element is the pattern attribute. And this allows you to specify a regular expression that the input must match. This is useful for input validation. I want to check that the user has typed an actual email address. 
I want to check that the user has typed an actual phone number. So I'm going to make sure that they typed in three digits inside parentheses, followed by three digits, a dash, and four digits. I don't want to get 37 as a phone number. So I can specify a regular expression that the input has to match before I will accept the form. How do I do this? Well, you may not be familiar with regular expressions, so let me quickly introduce you to some of the ideas. Now, regular expressions, um, they're very complex, and I could give you two or three lectures on regular expressions, but here's the TLDR, the 10 second introduction to regular expressions. So first of all, I can match any letter in the range A through Z by putting square brackets and A dash Z. That'll match the letter B, the letter C, the letter J. Any lowercase letter will match. I can do the same thing, but with capital letters to match any capital letter. Similarly, I can match any numeric digit with square brackets 0 9. If I want to match two letters, two lowercase letters, I would put in bracket A dash Z and then bracket A dash Z. So I'd have two of those. And that would match exactly two letters. If I want to match any character, a letter, a number, or a symbol, I can put a dot. And dot is a wildcard character that matches anything, including a space. If I want to match something a certain number of times, I can put in a regular expression, like a dash z, and then I can put curly braces and a number. And if I do that, it'll basically repeat the previous regular expression that many times. So, uh, for example, uh, I can say bracket a dash z, and in curly braces, the number five, and if you look down at my examples, that will match any word that's five letters long. It's exactly five lowercase letters long. I can also use the star, which says to match zero or more times. If something matches zero times, that means it's not there at all. So, for example, I could say capital R, and then in square brackets, I could have A dash Z, and close my square brackets and have a star, and that would match anything that starts with R followed by zero or more lowercase letters. So it would match Robert uh, as long as the O-B-E-R-T is lowercase. But it wouldn't match like R3 because 3 isn't a lowercase letter. Um, if I put a vertical bar, that's shift backslash on your keyboard right above the enter key. You hold down shift and hit that uh, backslash key. You'll get a vertical bar or a pipe. And the pipe is used to choose between two alternatives. So I can say this expression, vertical bar, this expression, and either one of those expressions will match. So I already showed you the first example here. If I have square bracket A through Z, and then in curly braces I have the number 5, that will match a word containing exactly five lowercase letters. If I have A through Z, 5, and then I have a vertical bar, and capital A through capital Z, 5, that will match a word that has five lowercase letters or five uppercase letters. It won't match words that have mixed case. So I have a capital letter followed by a lowercase letter followed by three capital letters. Even though it's five letters long, that won't match because I didn't have either five lowercase letters or five uppercase letters. Finally, if I have the letter M, a dot, a star, and the letter D, that will match things that start with M and end with D and have anything in between. So it'll match capital M, little d. It'll match capital M, little a, little d. Um, capital M. Uh, little e, little n, little d. Anything that starts with a capital M and ends with little d will match. Um, another attribute that I can set is a title. This is the text that comes up if the pattern doesn't match. So if you type in something that isn't a valid email address, maybe you want a pull message that says that is not a valid email address. Valid email addresses have a dat sign. Um, you can set a string uh, in the title attribute and that will appear. So I want to walk you really quickly through a more sophisticated example that combines some of these ideas I've talked about in this lecture. So here's an HTML form. Again, it starts with a form tag and ends with a slash form tag. And I've put my form fields into a field set. Remember, a field set is going to draw a nice little box around them, grouping them together. <coughs> in this case, I'm putting everything in the same group. I've given my field set the legend, example form. So that's going to show up as kind of like a little tab on top of the rectangle. Within the rectangle, within the field set, I'm going to have, I think, four, no, just three uh, inputs. The first is a text input that asks for the first name. And so I have a first name label followed by a, a first name input form. The name of the input is first, and the default value is Bob. So by default, it's going to put the word Bob inside this field. And it's a required field. They have to type in a first name. 
The next field is the phone number field. I've given it a phone number label, and I've given it um, the default value 395-2190. And then below that, I have a label for the course number, and I've used a select tag and a slash select tag to create a combo box with four options, CMSC 162, CMSC 201, ISCS 375, and ISCS 471. Um, again, if I were really doing this, I would give each of those options a value. Then I have my submit button, and I've changed the value of the submit button to enroll. So instead of saying submit, the button is going to say enroll. So here's what that looks like. Notice that I've got this box around my form. That's the field set. The words example form are kind of up at the top left of the rectangle. That's my legend. I have a first name label, and then I have an input. Notice that the default text, Bob, appears in the input. Then I have my phone number label and my phone number input. Notice that my default text 395-2190 appears in the input field. I have my course number label, and then I have my drop-down box with several courses to choose from. And my submit button has the text enroll on it, E-N-R-O-L-L. So in summary, HTML provides inputs for different uh, for forms. And some of those kinds of input are text boxes and several different flavors of that. Check boxes, radio buttons, text areas, combo boxes, and uh, we talked about uh, the date picker widget. And also, of course, buttons, submit and reset, are the two buttons that we've talked about. Forms are submitted to the server using post requests. And we'll talk about how to process them next time. And we can use the required attribute in a field element, an input element, to indicate that the field is required for the form to be submitted. And I'll see you next time.